Hello everyone and welcome to this series of videos on conservation paleobiology. So as I've made the case elsewhere in this course and in the other videos that are available to you, humans are having a significant effect on the biosphere. Our cities, our fossil fuel emissions and associated climate change, all of these things as nicely pictured by um, Adolf Valetti in the late 19th century, uh, as you can see from these images, are having an impact on the natural world. And many of us are worried about how we can try and minimize that impact. And that's what we're going to be talking about today as we are being introduced to conservation paleobiology. As I stressed in the uh, content on extinction, hence the doorway images on this slide, there is, I think, a strong case to be made that humans are having a significant impact on the biosphere. And many people characterize this as the sixth mass extinction. This situation is the reason why conservation is a necessary um, science or policy. Um, I've put a definition of conservation on the slide for you here. This is the plan of protection, maintenance, management, sustainable use and restoration of natural resources and the environment in order to secure their long-term survival. Traditionally, this has been couched very much in the present and on what I would call ecological timescales. These are timescales where we're trying to understand how to overcome human impacts based on the changes that these bring about over periods that we can observe. So we can look into history and we can try and use these to minimize our impact. In contrast to this, we have conservation paleobiology. This is a field of conservation which takes a slightly longer term view to inform these efforts. And I've put a uh, definition on the slide for you here. Conservation paleobiology is an emerging discipline that uses geohistorical data to meet these challenges by developing and testing models of how biota responds to environmental stresses. In particular, I note that in contrast to many of the other um, topics that we have covered in the videos that I've created for you, um, this is a really new field. 10 years ago, I it wasn't enough of a field really for me to create a lecture on. As such, this will be uh, reflected throughout these videos. Um, we'll have relatively fewer sources and um, relatively few general statements that um, I can make to create a cohesive narrative about conservation paleobiology. Often what I'm going to be giving you is a series of case studies of how we can use the past to inform, um, and by past I mean uh, geological history part type past, to inform uh, uh, conservation today. But because it is new, um, that also makes it a super exciting field. So I'm gonna dive right in. If we think about the current state of play, the effects of human innovation are now apparent on more than half of the Earth's ice-free landmass. That's what's shown in this graph here. So every, everything here you can see, um, these are human-modified um, landscapes. So we are impacting on more than half of the Earth's land-free uh, ice-free landmass. As an example, it's relatively close to home, most of the UK was originally a temperate rainforest, such as the one shown on the left-hand side here. So all of those idyllic country scenes that you see um, with fields and sheep in them are actually a human-created ecosystem. Hardly any unaltered ecosystems survive in the United Kingdom on the islands that we call home. This reflects a broader point. The environment is changing rapidly as socio-ecological systems and conservation itself are fast adapting and they're responding to emerging challenges. Conservation science and associated disciplines are thus trying to manage ecosystems to maintain biodiversity and also the processes that support resilience in the change of this, the, in the face of these changes and allow adaptation to ongoing climate changes and the new pressures that are inherent to life today. But this also brings us to something of a paradox. We're seeking to preserve systems that are ever-changing, meaning that conservation goals are basically moving targets. This is reflected nicely in this dude on the right. This is Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher famous for the observation, to paraphrase, that change is the only constant. This being the case, in conservation, we need to understand uh, change over timescales of decades, centuries, and millennia, so we can focus on the things that I've mentioned, the maintenance of processes, functions, and of course of resilience, um, in the light 
of these rates of change and changes in the past, rather than thinking of this as a, a way to save particular ecosystem states or population si sizes. The fossil record, and hence conservation paleobiology, is really the only way to understand this. In the literature that I've come across, I've often seen this referred to as the geohistorical record. FYI, I won't be using this term that much, but I thought you should know that this, when people talk about the geohistorical record, what they're talking about is this slightly longer term view that the fossil record can give us. So, in conclusion, we can say that conservation bio paleobiology helps us because actually, when conserving ecosystems, we need to be aware these are constantly changing, so we need to understand our baselines. As a concrete example of how conservation paleobiology and its deep time view helps us to maintain processes and functioning ecosystems, consider nature reserves. Looking at just the present day, we may be tempted to just fence off protected areas, such as uh, the example that's shown on the left hand side here. So stop things moving around and stop things encroaching on these areas and so um, create reserves through these fences. But it is a reality. I'm sorry to say that the current rate of global warming is faster than any that extinct species have experienced in their, um, in their past. In this light, fences won't work because if nature reserve boundaries are strictly delineated and enforced, species found within those reserves can't successfully track changes in climate, climate as the climate changes they cannot move around. As such, we nowadays think to successfully conserve modern ecosystems, we need to have suitable corridors or stepping stones that um, we develop to allow communities to move, such as these examples shown on the right hand side here. In extreme cases, if we want to um, protect the biodiversity of Earth, we may have to think about translocations. We may have to think about actually moving populations entirely in response to changes in climate. For such strategies, paleoecology and the fossil record can provide evidence-based projections of several things. It can tell us, number one, how species and communities in current nature reserves will react to predicted levels of climate change. And that is in terms of their migrations, their rain shifts, localized extinctions and broader extinctions. So this is something that we could call in situ con conservation. But number two, um, Paleoecology in the fossil record can tell us what species may, might be expected to naturally migrate in the light of climate change and the effects such migrations will have. Number three, we may expect the fossil record to tell us what combination of species may be suitable for translocations beyond their historical ranges to complete new regions. And number four, we might expect um, the fossil record to tell us how ecosystems might be expected to react to translocations, whether those are natural or not in the longer term. So that's four reasons that the fossil record is a valuable resource for paleobiology and sorry, for conservation um, in this world. So conservation paleobiology covers all kinds of time ranges. This diagram I think sums it up quite nicely. We can see that Bearing in mind that this is a log scale here, we have got um, instrumental records from, from the relatively recent past. We've got historical records that go back a tiny bit further. Indigenous and traditional knowledge goes back further still. But actually when it comes to um, what many paleontologists consider uh, a really deep time, um, the, the fossil record is one of our main sources of information. Perhaps when it comes to thinking about conservation paleobiology, it's useful to split this into two general camps. And I'm going to do so in the remainder of this video. I will talk about near time conservation paleobiology, which uses relatively young fossils, primarily from the past two million years, such as the Pleistocene, for example, to inform conservation practices today. And in contrast to that, we can think about deep time conservation paleobiology, which goes past that two million years. Um, and this is where we can use paleo data and the deep fossil records to inform bigger picture um, questions that's slightly, I guess, more um, less focused on today's problem, but looks for a more general pattern. So let's unpack this a little bit. Near time conservation paleobiology provides context for present day conditions focusing largely on extant species. And that allows us to do many things. 
It allows us to define baselines to compare conditions before and after, say, human disturbance. Um, it allows us to examine the response of species and ecosystems to recent natural and human perturbations. It shows us a historical range of variability. So um, we can place um, the changes that are happening today driven by humans into a broader context. And it allows us to set realistic targets for restoration. It also will allow us to differentiate between anthropogenic and non-anthropogenic change. So that's change that's driven by humans and change that is not. And it allows us to recognize factors that can be explained only by events or conditions that are not present in the system today. All of those are very, very useful things to us. A nice example of this is the extinction of the mammoths. This is a potential example of the response of a species to anthropogenic forcing. So I've put a paper here um, which suggests that mammoths went extinct in the because in the most recent interglacial period, mammoths suffered a catastrophic lack of habitat, or loss of habitat, sorry, I should say. The last glaciers retreated and the planet warmed, and 90% of the animals' former habitat disappeared. This left refugia, little pockets in which um, the remaining mammoths were living across Eurasia and tiny patches of, um, of suitable eco space um, squeezed up against the northern coastal edges of our continents. But we also note that mammoths survived similarly extreme interglacials and associated bottlenecks in the past before this last one. So then, then we have the question, what was it? about this last bottleneck that led to the death of many mammoths. Well, this paper makes the case the situation was compounded by human hunting. The paper models this and shows that even with optimistic estimates of mammoth population size and density, if each human killed just one mammoth every three years, the species would go extinct. Um, so whilst uncertainty in this area remains, there is a strong suggestion based on this work that we are ultimately responsible for the extinction of this um, very important species. And this is something that we can only know by looking at the fossil record. If it wasn't the fossil record, we wouldn't even know that these creatures had existed. You can contrast this quite nicely with a deep time approach. So in these deep time approaches, we can analyze biotic responses to changes in a system or perturbations of a range of diverse different kinds and magnitudes. This, in essence, uses the much older geological record as an archive of repeated natural experiments from which we can draw conclusions. Some of these may approximate present day disturbances or those predicted for the near future, such as substantial climate warming and ocean acidification. But also it allows us to think about testing biotic responses under a broader array of conditions than is available in the modern world or its recent past. And that's valuable um, because if we can identify consistent patterns involving now extinct species at remote periods in the past, we can strengthen the ecological theory underlying conservation practice. So it's, a, it's worthwhile in and of itself to understand these changes. So that's really, really cool. And a nice example of this is a, a, is a um, paper that I've used in um, two other sets of videos related to this course. So if you remember these, um, this is the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, and that could alternatively be included in this lecture because this shows the response of a series of organisms to fairly major environmental forcing. When we correct species richness, as shown on the left here, um, across a period of continental fragmentation for um, the amount of rocks, for example, that we have in the area, we see that as um, the continents fragmented towards the end of the Carboniferous period, this started off with an increase in biodiversity and then was met with a decrease in biodiversity and then slow recovery into the Permian. So rather than communities being fractured and less widespread to this, um, as a result to this Carboniferous rainforest collapse, this and the associated spatial reconstruction showed that um, contrary to many of our expectations, communities became more widespread, perhaps because there were fewer barriers in this post Carboniferous rainforest collapse world. So here a perturbation led to communities being better connected, but also led to a lower 
a lower global diversity. Is this a general pattern? We don't know for sure, but by doing more studies like this, we can hopefully start to understand whether it is, and that will inform our conservation practices in the future. So that was a whistle stop um, introduction to the world of conservation paleobiology, and I will see you very shortly in the next video where we continue looking into this exciting topic. I'll see you there.